Yeah, thanks, Victor. Um, th thanks, uh, the organizers, also for inviting me here to, uh, uh, to Mainz. Um, it's a wonderful uh, venue, I must say. Um, I uh, snuck in one uh, additional word uh, in the title, sound and solitonic excitations. Um, usually we, you know, we have heard a lot about sound and using phonons to drive, um, to drive superconductors. So um, actually we found a, a nice way to, to uh, look at these phonons. And um, it's brand new, so the slides are completely, you know, they just, I just made them, to be honest. But um, uh, let's see whether you like the, the, the story. The first part will be first a uh, little introduction on, on uh, Fermi gases because you know, some of you uh, um, uh, are maybe not completely tuned into this cold atom world. Um, what we uh, uh, want to do with these cold atoms is precisely to make contact um, between the cold gas world and the uh, other systems where you have strongly interacting um, uh, systems, for example, atomic nuclei or uh, neutron stars, white dwarfs, all these systems have very strong um, uh, fermion correlations in them. The neutron star does not collapse under further gravitational uh, attraction just because of the Pauli principle. And then, of, of course, we have already heard a lot about high TC superconductors, uh, which um, uh, have all these riddles uh, for us. And uh, we try in cold atoms to realize simple models that can uh, mimic uh, maybe the essence of such um, uh, materials uh, to learn how fermions uh, deal with the sign problem. Um, in Fermi gases, we have um, lots of different knobs um, um, at our disposition. We can tune the interactions, which is a wonderful thing. Um, we, we would wish we could do that with electrons. That would be uh, fantastic on a large scale. Um, but in cold atoms, you, 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 uh, you can. You can uh, play with the geometry, the spin composition, etc. And then on the one hand, realize idealized models of many-body physics, which allows to benchmark the many-body problem. Examples would be the unitary Fermi gas in the bulk, or the Fermi-Hubbard model, which is realized in optical lattices. But also we can hope to create entirely new systems that have no counterpart in nature, and uh, uh, possibly dipolar Fermi gases may be brought into a superfluid state. Um, also, there's hope for creating topological superfluids, and um, that, that's a, a second part of this, of this work with cold gases, which is quite exciting, which goes completely beyond of what we, what we currently uh, know. Uh, I think I should um, introduce Feschbach resonances because they're such a wonderful tool, and not everyone has heard of them, uh, and usually it's just mentioned and then uh, uh, glossed over. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful uh, tool where you bring uh, the um, energy of two colliding atoms into resonance with the bound state of these two colliding atoms. So, so you bring a molecular state up in energy to be resonant with the energy of free atoms. Then they will spend a lot of time in this molecular state until they realize eventually they don't quite have the right energy to stay there and then they will leave again. So you enhance the scattering process. And um, if such a thing, such a tool uh, would become available again for, for electronic systems, it would be a revolution. So that's why I think it's worth uh, having this in the back of, of everyone's mind that you know, creating a resonance is always a, a fantastic thing. Just to train our eyes, I uh, have here movies of uh, a red and a blue Fermi gas. Well, these are two hyperfine states of the lithium-6 atom, um, spin down and spin up, we can call them also. And they, they, they live in an overall um, uh, laser beam trap and um, also harmonic potential. So uh, I will show you what happens when they don't interact. It's actually pretty simple. They just trade places. They just run through each other as you would expect for two gases living in some harmonic trap. They, they don't see each other at all. I should say these gases are a million times thinner than air. The size here is 100 microns roughly, the length scale. and. Uh, uh, we have about a million of these, of these atoms uh, in there, so it's extremely dilute gas. So now, when we switch on resonant interactions, you might still not expect something dramatic to happen because it's such a dilute gas. But actually, if you slam a spin up and a spin down gas into each other at the Feschbach resonance, they actually bounce off each other. That's how strong the interaction is. And um, 
only after a very long time they slowly diffuse into each other with the quantum limited diffusion in fact uh, until they eventually overlap. Once they overlap and we cool the system, um, we can uh, explore uh, superfluidity of these fermions. We can uh, cross over from a Bose-Einstein condensate of molecules um, to a barding cooper schrieffer state of um, long-range Cooper pairs. I, I'll switch this on. Uh -huh. No. Yes. Um, so so th this is actually a remarkable thing, that there is a material in nature where you can just tune the interaction between two fermions and go from this limit of point-like bosonic pairs to these long-range Cooper pairs going through what we call a crossover uh, superfluid. There, the average pair size is on the order of the interparticle spacing. So this is a strongly interacting soup where they probably change places uh, uh, very often. Um, over a decade ago, I feel old, uh, we demonstrated um, that these gases support superfluidity by um, performing the rotating bucket experiment, if you wish. Uh, we uh, trapped an ultra-cold gas into a focused laser beam rotated around with two green laser, laser beams which acted as spoons and the hope was that upon expansion you would see um, a large uh, vortex lattice with many quantized vortices running through um, this, this gas. So this is the experiment. You take your two PowerPoint spoons and rotate them around. I'm very proud of this animation. And uh, it turns out in, uh, to form a wonderful vortex uh, uh, lettuce. This worked out in the entire crossover from the Bose-Einstein condensate regime to the barding cooper schrieffer regime and demonstrated superfluidity and phase coherence in these gases of fermionic atom pairs. Question is now, you know, a decade later, do we understand these uh, things, these strongly directing Fermi gases in the bulk? Again, there's no lettuce here. This is not the Fermi Hubbard model. This is the, uh, a bulk model where you have a unitary interaction between the gases. For example, we know that the ground state energy has to be some universal number times the ground state energy of a non-directing Fermi gas. Do we know that number? Mean field theory gives us 0.59, the experiment gives us 0.37, so that tells us this mean field ansatz is clearly not so good, but of course um, people have refined this. This is our experimental measurement of the equation of state for this unitary gas, so this is the density properly normalized as a function of the chemical potential divided by temperature. It's a nice way to represent the equation of state. The non-directing gas in this representation is just normalized to be one. But this is actually a measured one. And uh, mean field theory is, is here. So it's sort of pretty bad um, compared to the error bars. And these are a bunch of, of uh, theoretical approaches that have been uh, developed over the years to understand this strongly directing Fermi gas. And it's nice for an experimentalist to be in a position where you can say like, ah, these guys are a little bit better than these guys. Um, this is where we, where we want to be with cold gases, that we can really perform sort of a Feynman quantum simulation of a um, uh, very difficult uh, to solve Hamiltonian, in this case, the unitary Fermi gas. But how about the excitations? There's a vast body of work uh, that has been done on these Fermi gases, collective oscillations, first sound, second sound has been seen, pair breaking has been seen, polarons were found, etc. So it's, it's actually a wonderful uh, a, a story that I cannot possibly do justice. Um, but uh, what about the superfluid wave function? We do know that we have meta waves, but we don't know what the wave equation is. So this is very different from uh, the good old times when we have a, had a Grospodevsky equation and could uh, just, just uh, compare experiments and theory uh, in pristine fashion to each other and it all worked beautifully. This is a strongly directing Fermi gas, so I cannot write down easily uh, an, an equation that captures what, what I see. There are, of course, approximations which you can tailor to, to, to work, but um, a priori we don't know this wave equation. So we set out uh, to form these solitonic uh, waves as a, a nice probe for the wave-like properties of these gases. Uh, solitons have been, of course, uh, produced in, in Bose-Einstein condensates 
uh, very early on by Klaus Zingstock, for example, and, and, and Bill Phillips. Um, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful localized object that ha um, it's sort of the superfluid's own impurity, if you want, which has a width given by the healing length. And how, how do you make it? You have to twist the phase of the superfluid by pi on one side of your, of your soliton, and then this uh, object is going to be stable, metastable. Uh, it's an excited state, of course, of your system, but it will live uh, for a long time, and actually we will see how it can possibly uh, decay. So here I'm showing the, the, the famous uh, pictures from uh, the, the Hanover experiment, uh, Klaus, and uh, here the Bill Phillips experiment on uh, solitons in Bose-Einstein condensates. What is different for fermionic superfluids? Um, well, um, I thought we should uh, look at um, this textbook picture of uh, BCS superconductivity, where here I have a particle branch which is shifted down by the chemical potential because I have to work in the grand canonical ensemble. The whole branch, well, that's just an inverted parabola, and the pairing gap does nothing but opening a pairing gap <laughs> uh, near the Fermi momentum. So that's my order parameter for this BCS superfluid. And if I now twist it, if I now let it change in space and make even a zero crossing, then um, locally the situation looks like here, this is an open gap. Here I have closed the gap, and here I have reopened the gap with the opposite sign. When I see this, and I have uh, learned quite a bit about topological stuff, I realize when I do such a gap uh, closing with the opposite sign of, of some uh, real order parameter, I have to have a bound state. And in this case, it's called the Andreev bound state. There's also a bound state that exists inside the soliton. Uh, so that, that makes it interesting. Actually, in the limit of a very small gap, you can linearize this uh, dispersion of the <coughs> fermions, of the p particles and the holes, and you see that it must reduce to a Dirac equation. And uh, th this was solved um, for a stationary soliton already in 1976, where Jakiv and Rebbe really thought about uh, what happens when I change the mass of my particles uh, as a function of space, I even have, have it make it negative. I, I still don't quite understand why they even thought about this. Like, why do you think about making your mass negative? But it, it is uh, miraculous. They, they they did this and found out that yes, indeed, there is a bound state, which they didn't call Andrea state, but like a bound state that uh, lives inside this uh, soliton. Um, in this limit, it has this beautiful property that it's exactly one half particle and one half hole. So it's actually the first example of fractionalization in, in uh, uh, physics. And only very recently, uh, Viktor Galitsky, who is, I think, our chairman for this session, uh, and um, his student, who is also here, um, uh, um, FMP, um, solved the problem of the mobile soliton uh, exactly. And that's a, that's a beautiful story that, that maybe you will, you will hear about. In now, in, in three dimensions, what do we expect? Uh, well, we can use, to get some intuition, the, the Grosbedevsky equation and see uh, what happens um, in three dimensions. You get uh, not only a planar soliton, you get vortices, you get vortex rings, you get even much more complicated uh, uh, configurations as, as found out by Joachim Brandt uh, 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 and, and uh, his colleague. Um, in, in fact, there is a zoo of excitations. Um, what we will do in the experiment is we will study precisely what happens to this planar soliton, which is an excited state of the system in three dimensions as it decays. And there is a prediction of what should happen in such a fermionic case, uh, as, as one, one knows from also the Grospedevsky equation, it should, the soliton should snake, it is unstable towards snaking and break into vortex, anti-vortex pairs. How we make it? Well, we just take the old technique that was so successful in, in Hanover and uh, Hamburg and, and NIST and imprint a phase on one side of the superfluid but not on the other. So by shining in uh, off-resonant light here. And we shine this in for uh, long enough so that the phase over here is pi. Now we have to uh, uh, carefully check out what the um, defect is that we are creating. So we actually slice our three-dimensional uh, cloud. Uh, again, this is on the order of like 100 microns times 50 microns times 50 microns uh, uh, 
in size, so we can actually nicely optically select maybe uh, the, the, the central 10 microns, for example, of this, of this gas, using a, um, a beam that pushes all the other atoms that we don't want to see into some other invisible hyperfine state. And then we can take an absorption image and maybe, if you're lucky, catch uh, an impurity, a, a vortex or, or soliton um, in the image. So uh, this is what we do. This is the cloud again, uh, the probe pulse. There's a wire that casts this shadow from the, we call it the blaster beam, which it removes all the other atoms that we don't want to look at. And then we take this, uh, uh, this nice image. And in this particular case, we caught it where there was, well, either a soliton or a vortex. Just from this image, you cannot know. Uh, we see um, situations like these where after doing this uh, phase imprint, we have uh, one interesting object uh, inside our cloud. And now as we di displace the slicer beam, we can check whether it's a planar soliton or whether it's maybe just a single vortex line. And so this tomographic imaging allowed us to distinguish uh, these things. And uh, in this case, it is a, sing a single vortex line. But now let's see what happens uh, uh, as a function of time right after the phase imprint in the spirit of this uh, conference. Um, the phase imprint happens in this, the, the center. That's where the, the edge of the green light is. And you saw initially some sound wave emanating from this region that was sort of, uh, for this part of the talk, the boring effect. And there is, however, an interesting central defect um, that is very slow compared to sound and uh, sticks around and acquires a life on its own. It wiggles around and uh, eventually breaks up. And after some time, you mostly see only two dots on opposite sides. And after even longer, you, you start seeing a line again, and that line actually Processes in the cloud. So just to uh, go through the, the, the movie, um, the first nine milliseconds are shown here. You see this, this uh, beautiful sound front emanating from where we uh, made the green. That's, of course, not what we want to create, but you always create a little bit of mess, uh, in, in the, which is carried away in the form of sound. But there's this central depletion, which is zoom. I have a zoom in here, uh, which is actually the soliton. And you can use your tomographic imaging now to, to scan where, where, whether you see the soliton in, in all the uh, layers of your, of your system. So this shows us we do have a planar soliton initially, because we see this defect in all the planes of the three-dimensional cloud. And after some while, the soliton starts to wiggle. You see some of these wiggles here in the images. And uh, eventually, it will actually die by forming a vortex ring. This is shown here, where here you see it actually breaking up. Uh, uh, it's quite nice. And it forms a vortex ring, which is mostly, uh, wi which you see as like two dots, two dots, two dots in every one of these slices, uh, apart from the top and bottom, where it's a line. So this reconstructed looks just like a ring. Uh, and, and it keeps going. Um, I will not fully bore you with, with all the details just, that happen later, but since you're since interested. You do your images basically every time you destroy your system. Yes. So basically means that this is a very deterministic way of how it happens. Yes. It's completely dependent on things like how you always Yes. So it's classical. It's, it's a beautifully classical uh, um, uh, life that this soliton has once you make it. It's really just like a classical membrane that, that wobbles around. And if you have some... Um, some slight imbalance, imperfection in how you create it. For example, if this green light is not perfectly straight down, but it has a slight angle, you will always break the, um, the symmetry between whether it should go left or should go right. And actually, it always does the same thing. Turns out we can tune this. We can just defocus the plane, make it look like you know, slanted this way or slanted that way. And we can control which way it goes. But it is perfectly deterministic. Otherwise, we couldn't take these sort of movies, yeah. right? Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, so um, let me give an outlook on this part. Um, what would be exciting would be to see these Andreev states. And I tell you one reason why they're extremely exciting to me is when you put one more excess fermion in your superfluid, 
uh, you, this guy cannot find a partner to pair up with. So what does it do? It could delocalize over the superfluid. Well, that would cost a pairing gap worth of energy. That's costly. Um, or let's see, maybe it could just this, uh, tell the superfluid to form a soliton because then it could sit inside the soliton inside one of these Andreev states. Why not? Now, how much does that cost? You can figure out, you know, once you make the soliton of width given by the coherence length, uh, after a little bit of, of thinking, it is on the order of the pairing gap, but with a prefactor in, in one dimension, you can calculate it exactly, that is 2 over pi, which is smaller than 1. So this is energetically favorable. So you can, you can see that once you put impurities into your superfluid, they should um, uh, make the superfluid f develop uh, uh, solitonic excitations. Actually, we don't quite know what happens in three dimensions, uh, but there is a prediction um, from a long, long time ago that there should be soliton trains forming. Um, if we put one impurity, we only need one soliton. If we need many impurities, we just need many solitons that form a soliton train. So this is the famous Larkin of Chinnikov uh, state that, that uh, uh, I would love to, to see. Now you see one problem. Um, the, the density for this gas has to be really constant. Otherwise, you will have different spatial periods in different regions of your trap. And that's, that's terrible. Um, if, if, you, if you're after seeing this, this full de Ferrer Larkin of Chinnikov uh, phase, you have to make sure that your density and also your, your spin imbalance is constant acro across the trap. So we had to give up the harmonic trap that we liked so much, these laser traps, and uh, go into a box, fermions in a box. It sounds a little bit like snakes on a plane. Um, I didn't watch the movie. But um, this, is, this is our, our box. It's also made by laser light, but now repulsive uh, uh, laser light, uh, a cylinder of green light, and two end caps that close off your Coke can, or how you want to call, call this uh, shape. The first thing that um, anyone with such a box would like to see is that the Fermi Dirac distribution actually comes out. So um, it's not such an easy experiment as, you know, just one mouse click um, might, might, might appear, um, might make, make appear. But um, we were uh, quite happy to see that in these uh, time of flight distributions at low temperatures, uh, you see the Pauli blocking at exactly, and that was a difficult part, one particle per, um, per uh, momentum state. And uh, there is also the formation of the Fermi surface. So these guys are, are very happy, Fermi, Dirac, and, and Pauli. Uh, this happened roughly uh, at the 19th anniversary of this formula. We also have a superfluid in the box, which is signaled by pair condensation in this, uh, in this box shown here. So now we are in good shape to use the box for, for some interesting uh, many-body physics. And the first thing you might come up when you're a physicist and you have a box of stuff, you shake it. That's what you do. And you use a Bose loudspeaker to shake it because you work with uh, bosonic degrees of freedom. Um, this is, by the way, an MIT guy, Bose. Uh, we get it for not free, but like cheaper. It's good. Um, th this is our box. Um, you might realize it's not perfect, and that's actually good for us. Um, if you imagine, like now, um, throwing some sound onto there, um, whoop, it might actually form some sort of sound wave. Now, of course, we cannot do that, except we can. <laughs> um, uh, but we do it slightly differently. There is there's a way to use this guy. If you want, you, I can tell you later. There is a right way to actually use this Bose loudspeaker. Um, we, we can simply, uh, well, for example, apply a gradient uh, and, and shake the box, uh, which is certainly, certainly fun. Um, or we can uh, modulate the walls of the box, the height of the box. And since the box is not perfect, this will squish the box um, periodically. And there, thereby, we can excite higher order modes. For example, here, the first symmetric mode that, that lives in this box. Uh, that's actually quite nice because now you can take a spectrum of your shaking frequency on the x-axis and you measure the energy directly on the y-axis. How we do that might also be a good question for the question then. Um, and you see these uh, beautiful resonances of sound living in this, uh, uh, in this box. Now, depending on what your field is, this might be less or more exciting to you. I find it really exciting 
because usually in these harmonic traps, the lowest collective excitations that you have, well, first of all, the dipole mode completely decouples from the interactions of the system, so it's, it, it's boring. Um, whereas here, the dipole mode is already interesting. Um, then the next higher modes, they all depend on this trap frequency, and uh, it, it's a complicated affair. Whereas now in this box, it's really just uh, uh, some, th the mode number is just n times pi over the length of the box, and my uh, 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 frequency is the speed of sound times that, times that wave vector. And, and so I get um, all the even modes at integer multiples of uh, the fundamental mode. The way we shake here is we, we excite the box symmetrically, so we will only see the symmetric modes. This is the second, this is the fourth, this is the sixth, and then here uh, you have to have some imagination. Turns out this is not a superfluid, this is a normal state uh, above TC, and we know that we should expect sound because this is a very hydrodynamic gas, um, which has, well, we would expect sound also in a classical gas, but like this is a, um, a rather inviscous gas which should give us sharp sound resonances already above TC. Below TC, however, I find it quite remarkable what happens. A lot of this spectral weight, if you want, goes away and these resonances become really quite sharp. Honestly, I think we can make them even sharper by cooling more, but this is sort of the, the first tries that we, that we have. Um, now, you want to check out what are these modes, what do they look like. I labeled them by the mode number, so these are all the symmetric modes that live in this box, the symmetric longitudinal modes that live in this box. And let's see, uh, I can just plot the position Inside the box, these are in situ pictures, sort of, time resolved. This is, this is just in situ, averaged over one direction, over the boring direction. And now this is time down here. And you see how this first symmetric mode uh, does its thing that you know from the textbooks. And there's actually a little bit of a nonlinear uh, contribution of the uh, fourth mode also in, in there. This is the fourth mode, uh, more nodes. Sixth mode, eighth mode, tenth mode. More nodes uh, as, you, as you go that way, and also you see higher damping. So we lose the, the sound faster and faster. Um, what about the fundamental mode? Well, we cannot excite it with this shaking, with this um, symmetric shaking, but of course with the gradient we can excite it. And here is the fundamental mode. That's just the sloshing back and forth in this, in this box trap. Uh, uh, let's zoom in onto one example. For example, the, the sixth mode, which has all these uh, wonderful uh, wiggles. Um, it, is, it is really what you would draw in a, in a um, textbook or, or you, um, in, in some undergraduate class. Uh, these, are, these are two cuts of the spatial wave function at two different positions, here and here. And um, you can also look at uh, two cuts um, at two different spatial positions versus time and see how things uh, oscillate and, and uh, uh, work happily. Here's a nice example of the second uh, the second mode, the first symmetric mode, uh, which immediately shows you this is, um, there is some admixture of uh, uh, the fourth harmonic mode and, and uh, actually maybe even others. Um, so that's interesting. You drive actually at the symmetric mode number two and you get some admixture of symmetric mode number four. So that's some nonlinear coupling that's, that's also in the, uh, uh, quite naturally in the, in the system. Um, now, as the, as the last slide, I allow myself uh, uh, two equations. Uh, one is the one that, uh, um, the left part of which you, you're familiar with, that is the, the equation for the propagation of sound. You have the current in the z direction, say, um, and, and this, this gives you the, the, uh, the, uh, essentially the force equation, Newton's equation, which tells you this current is driven by pressure gradients in the, in the gas. Uh, on the right side, you have the friction term, which is coming from viscosity. Um, now, the force due to viscosity is always like this coefficient eta times the gradient of the velocity. That's, that's the, the viscous force. But only if you have gradients of, this viscous, of that viscous force in your, in your sample will one slab be slowed down compared to the other. So it requires the second derivative of the velocity um, of sound. And therefore, the, th this gives you, it's a little bit different from, from a simple damped harmonic oscillator. This damping actually depends on k squared, you know, the uh, wave factor squared. 
uh, and so the damping gets stronger and stronger for larger and larger sound uh, frequencies. And um, well, this is uh, sort of observable in the superfluid uh, picture. I should have shown rather the, the normal gas, which has, where you see it essentially by, by eye, that this damping is um, beautifully linear um, with mode number squared. Now, if you uh, just fit this, the dk versus k squared, you get eta over rho, the viscosity divided by the mass density of the fluid, which must have units of h bar over m. It turns out it's, a, it's the kinematic vis viscosity. It is, uh, has units of a diffusion coefficient. And uh, in a unitary gas, it must have close to Tc on the order of the Fermi energy. It must have units of h bar over m and, and, and a prefactor that's on the order of 1. And it turns out, well, we find 0.18. Don't quote me on this. This is preliminary, even though I'm videotaped. Great. Um, <laughs> um, that was my wave to the students. So we'll uh, not be happy that I showed this. But um, I, I'm excited. So, so that's, uh, that's great. So you see the superfluid does something rather dramatic once you cool down. There seems to be a jump in the viscosity, which is even predicted. There should be a sort of a jump on the order of the pairing gap divided by Tc. And, uh, we have only these two data points at the moment. So we have to scan this now versus temperature and, and see whether we see this, this uh, uh, interesting uh, sudden rapid decrease in the viscosity. Um, as an outlook, uh, of course, we, as, we, as I said, let's measure this versus temperature across the superfluid transition and really get a good handle at the, this important transport coefficient in the unitary gas. Let's then study spin imbalanced mixtures where probably we should get two sound modes uh, for this majority and the minority. That would be exciting. Um, why don't we shake in the Fermi Hubbard model? Well, these were the, the, the images that we had um, roughly a year ago, site resolved uh, images of fermionic mod insulators. We need a box. Let's just make a box of these fermionic mod insulators and uh, let the atoms slosh in that box back and forth. So we're actually doing these experiments right now also in the Fermi Hubbard model. And uh, that will be um, one way to get at an important transport uh, coefficient. And eventually, I, I'm still intrigued by the possibility of <coughs> observing FFLO. Um, now with the, with the box, we might have a good handle uh, at that. So with that, I come to uh, uh, thank my group, who has done an amazing uh, job. This is, these are the fermions in the box. They have done. Uh, most of the work that was in this in this talk. Um, I'd also, also like to acknowledge uh, the visiting professor Zoran Hajibabic, who um, uh, did a sabbatical with us, and we go way back, so that was a wonderful uh, time together. Um, Fermi 1, I haven't talked at all about. These, these guys make ultra-cold molecules, and you can um, uh, maybe uh, look up their work, uh, which is uh, uh, extremely uh, nice. And uh, uh, these are the folks who study single uh, uh, atom resolution images of Fermi Hubbard uh, model, models in two dimensions and are now uncovering uh, the transport coefficients in that model. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>